<laughs> so can you hear me? <laughs> so welcome to the, the system session. My name is Jose Adam, for those who know, and I will be the chair of this session. So uh, the first speaker is a research assistant at the uh, Ordnokon Gyurike University in Magdeburg. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, he became an active member of the Red Community since 2019, and he's uh, focused mostly in the domain of security of IoT devices uh, with focus on access control. He's going to present about the Riot Peripheral Self-Testing self Shield. Um, so uh, let's please give a, um, a warm applause uh, round for Marian Bushy again. Very much, yeah. Then let's start with the graphical uh, self-testing shield or hunting bugs in back mode. Um, let me see if I can control the screen somehow. That looks good, perfect. Okay, so this talk is largely based on the previous paper of us. And before we dive in, uh, let's uh, start with some background. This is basically the thing that we heard already from Peter Ignazio in the keynote. Uh, Riot supports a lot of microcontrollers of different families and different vendors. And in order to write portable applications, we have consistent APIs, hardware abstractions layers. And um, yeah, um, the issue is that we have relatively largely different parameters. So without this parameter layers, without this hardware abstraction layers, it would be completely impossible to write a portable application. So it's a cornerstone of Riot, as Peter Schmerzel already said. But there is a problem with this. It is relatively difficult to write consistent behavior across all of those microcontroller families, especially in regard to corner cases or exotic features. Let's say we have one guy who is the ST guy, one guy who is the SAM guy, and one guy who is the NRF guy, and they read the same documentation of the same API. It could be that they interpret this in three different ways, and now we have three different implementations that are not exactly compatible in, uh, in regard to each other, especially uh, concerning the corner case. So this is the issue that we have. Then in addition, testing is difficult. We cannot just write software on unit tests. If we would do so, we would not actually test what we want to test. For example, if we set the GPIO to high, we want to test that the GPIO is actually high. We cannot do this in software. So we need the microphone on. That's not ideal. Yeah, then let me just shout uh, and see how that works. Okay. Yeah, as you can see, not only for Apple drivers are difficult, but all the microphones are quite difficult. Not very nice. Yeah. And, and now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, where was I? <laughs> Testing is quite difficult, so we actually have to test the hardware behavior. And this is quite some effort because we have to connect some kinds of uh, logic analyzer or an oscilloscope, and there will always be some manual effort required. Even if we use a decoder, we have to configure the, the decoder that we want to decode SPI, we want to uh, configure the bit order and so on. So there is always some manual labor involved, which is also a problem. And finally, the code is quite fragile. If we get a new family of a microcontroller with an existing parapple, but with a faster CPU, it could be that all the timings that previously worked fine now no longer work fine because of the faster CPU. But if we upgrade the tool chain and the optimizer generates faster code, it could be that the timings no longer work because of the faster code. So what we do have is that we do need a lot of testing, not only once, but every time we get a new family. We have code that is quite difficult to write, at least to write correctly and consistently. And finally, testing sucks. So this is a recipe for disaster, as you can see with the lots of bugs we have in the peripheral drivers. And well, before actually apply to all operating systems that do have uh, multiple vendors inbound. But for right, we have some issues in addition or some challenges in, uh, to addition. We have a very diverse and heterogeneous community and we need to also make sure that the testing works. Uh, 
in a distributed way because no one in the wild community has all the hardware we want to test. So we need to also distribute the testing equipment in a way that we actually can do this testing. This is a unique challenge we have to take in mind in addition in the wild community. Yeah, we have some previous works on this. We have um, Philip on the hill. Um, Philip on the hill basically connects the second microcontroller uh, to the first. And this can verify then the output uh, on a signal level. This means it will catch all the bugs. This is excellent. Um, but the issue is that uh, there is some effort to set this up. So we have to configure all the applications uh, with the correct pin mapping. Um, for the use case, this was intended. That is for the CI, we have a one-time setup. So this effort is paid once and the profit is for all eternity. This is a pretty good compromise, uh, but if we don't target the CI, but the distributed testing, this is not the perfect fit. Then we have also some, yeah, I couldn't find any papers for testing using wires, uh, but this is actually quite widely deployed to just use some uh, jumper wires. The idea is to create a loopback. For example, the UART output is connected to the input, and if we read back what we send, chances are good it worked. The issue is, of course, that we do not do signal level verification here. If we send it in the wrong way, let's say we take a parity bit where we shouldn't take a parity bit, and we read it in the wrong way, we expect a parity bit, it will just work fine, but it wasn't correct. So we cannot catch all the bugs. Um, another issue is that, at least for me, the false positive rate is about 50% because <laughs> connecting wires is surprisingly difficult. Yeah, <laughs> so this is also really bad. But actually, it's quite a good fit for our uh, development model because jump power, as everyone has them around, it distributes quite well. But the cons are quite large. So let's say uh, try if we can improve on that. And the idea is to take those wires and turn them into PCBs. And we just did that. And let's see if this works out from the cost perspective. We have two versions of the PCB. The first version uses through hole technology, and we can build one board for less than $10, shipping not included. <laughs> this is fine uh, for the hacker at home who wants to order and build this uh, by herself or himself, but it's not fine for distributing, let's say, 50 PCBs at a conference. Then we have uh, the same PCB as a surface mount technology variant. And now we get uh, it for 150 bucks with shipping and taxes included. So three US dollar per PCB. This is much better if we want a lot of them. But of course, if we just want one of them, it's 150 bucks uh, for 50 and 49 cut and go to the garbage bin. So now let's look at what we actually have as the expansion board formats that we want to uh, manufacture our PCB for. Uh, there are a number of different formats uh, that we could pick from. For example, there is all these Arduino boards. We have the Adafruit Feather. We have the ESP D1 mini format. We have Micro Duino. We have Microbit. And we have Olimax UART. And most of them actually uh, expose all of the peripherals that we want to test. So they would be feature-wise a good fit. But if we look at the adoption, and here we look at the number of boards equipped with this standard we can get, not with the number of shields we can get. So this is kind of inverse logic here, because we build the PCB and want to get lots of boards that can make with it, and not we have the, uh, the board and want lots of shields to it. And for this, only the Arduino Uno standard and the Adafruit Feather standard actually have a relatively high adoption using thumb mathematics. So we look at those two in detail. And for each CPU family that we support, I checked if I can find at least one board uh, that matches the form factor. And I found 25 uh, for the Arduino form factor and 15 for the Adafruit Feather form factor. So the Arduino Uno uh, form factor would be the most supported one for our CPU families. Yeah, then we take this and the testing approach is basically, as I said, we are using a loop. So we're looping the output to the input. 
For GPIO, this just means we connect two GPIOs and then one is configured as output and one as input. For UART, we uh, connect uh, the transmit pin to the receive pin, uh, the same for SPI. For I2C, this doesn't really work. This has this master-slave communication principle, and if we just connect the data to the clock, uh, yeah, I see a lot of shaking heads. Yeah, it's obvious that this is not a good idea. But what we can do is we can use an I2C GPIO expander and connect the GPIOs to regular GPIOs and check if we send I2C commands uh, that we control uh, can control the GPIOs in a way that we actually expect. Uh, the GPIO extender is a good choice because it's cheap and the GPIOs can be used for other stuff as well. So we can check I2C on a high level, not on a low level. We can check ADC quite easily using PVM pins, and that way we can also check PVM pins by just using a PVM DAC using a low-pass filter. Um, yeah. And that's basically the idea. There are some quirks, like using a timer to estimate if, for example, the symbol rate of the Hubert interface actually is plausible. Of course, we don't actually measure the time it takes to transfer the data. We measure the time it takes to transfer the data plus some overhead. So there is some room for error, but it's better than nothing. And if we check what we can actually test with this, when we look at all the aspects and features of the peripherals, for GPIO, we are able to test everything with this. So this is actually good coverage. For URAT, we can test everything. But some require a bit of dark magic and are not so precise, so it's okayish. Uh, then uh, for SPI, I'm sorry that I always have to look to this notebook. My slides are not on this one; it's a bit difficult. Um, yeah, for SPI, we can not check everything. For example, the bit order is something that we just cannot uh, check without Philip on there. But uh, yeah, that was the compromise that we wanted to make. Uh, for I2C, it's even worse. We just have this high-level data integrity. If the GPIO extender works as we expect, then we assume it's good. Uh, ADC is quite fine, but this is mostly due to the limited ADC API, which doesn't have so many features that we actually can test. And then finally, PVM. We can test the duty cycle, but we cannot really test frequency. Well, the low-pass filter would uh, not work if the frequency is super low, but that's not good enough, so we take this as the no. Uh, so finally, we can actually test uh, 15 aspects and features in detail. Four are partially, partially tested, and five are not tested, which is quite okay for uh, that price. And then finally, the app design. We did this uh, a little bit different than our usual approach. We just have a single tap parameter syndication. This has some benefits. The most obvious is that we flash one application, which takes like three seconds or so to run, and then we have the result. So when flashing takes 10 seconds, plugging the PCB takes 10 seconds, and the result uh, takes three seconds, we are less than half a minute, and we know if they have the or not. So that is quite good. Also, it can test some, thinking, uh, some aspects that we do not cover before. For example, we have a lot of peripherals that provide multiple serial interface, like, for example, the NIF controllers. They can provide an SPI or an I2C, and the hardware can only provide one. And if you configure them as both, previously, it didn't work. And this was something that we never caught because our test application tested them individually, and the conflict was never obvious. But if we test them all in one app, the resource conflict would be obvious, and we would actually catch this kind of bugs as well. But this has a disadvantage. If we use all the peripheral drivers in one application, we have also to pay the price for them in terms of ROM. So we have to make sure that we are yeah, a bit uh, more efficient ROM wise in the uh, app so that we can still target as many bots as possible. Yeah, and we save ROM by using very short and concise messages. We don't actually have a failing message, but we just give the line number where something failed. In the source code, then there can be a comment that explains what action was tested. So there's an overhead of opening your editor to actually figure out what went wrong. Uh, but this is good enough, and it really saves a lot of uh, wrong. Yeah.
And finally, we use soft dependencies by features optional, so we can test uh, with this test application, for example, if only GPIOs are supported, then everything else really does not be tested and used. Okay, I won't be able to do the demo on this Windows machine, but I pasted some output here. This would be how a critical failure would look like, as we can see that here that line number is given. And in the code, we directly see that the initialization of the GPIO extender failed. So we now, either the I2C bus is not working as expected, or more likely, it's not on the pins it should be. This is how non-critical failures would look like. So if something didn't work, but the test could resume. And this is, for example, the Arduino Drew. And this is the only board that we have with this MCU, and it's not so largely used. So we do expect it to not be so well supported. And the results indicate that, yes, indeed, there are a, a surprising amount of bugs. So this looks quite fine. Um, now we have uh, the NRF uh, 52840DK, which is widely used in our community. So we expect that it passes. And indeed, everything passes. So this would be the output if everything works. OK, so the summary is that we can actually get quite cheap PCBs. They are still at least one order of magnitude more expensive than just jumper wires. But the failure rate is much better. So we get one for about $3 if we have, uh, an, yeah, if we can order 50 of them. If we just order one, it's still $10, but that is still okay -ish, I guess. The test runs fully automatic and the test coverage is okay -ish. It's relatively good, I guess, because what not covered are the bad things like the bit order. This is something that's not a corner case. If you transmit all in the wrong bit order to your uh, transceiver, then the transceiver is not going to work. So likely, we, we don't have this kind of bugs. In practice, it's actually quite OK, this test coverage. And it's uh, super fast. And finally, plugging in this PCB is super easy. It's like 10 seconds at most. So my hope is that testing no longer is so much a pain in the ass, and we can do this more often which hopefully results in lots of bugs being found and fixed. Yeah, and one last remark, uh, 40 PCBs I have with me, they are not completely soldered yet. I have to solder in the, the bottom pin headers, which is about 30 seconds. But over the course of the next two days, I will hand them out uh, to active members. Yeah, thank you very much. the same, right? Okay, then I can just take this one. So uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Any questions from the audience? Hey, uh, thanks for doing this. Um, seeing that the better coverage is, um, the, the better covers other chips than the Arduino board, um, do you think it would be possible in the future to have a board that uh, supports either by adding two more rows of jumpers, uh, two more rows of pins? That'd be too grand to do. What, what do you mean with like um to, like to have a, board, uh, a shield that works both as a feather uh, oh, okay. and as an arena cable? Okay, arena okay. cable or cable, whatever they call it. Yeah, but I remember that set could be something. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, the, the feather actually is the second most interesting, and this would be kind of if this works. And it actually works out, and I'm quite optimistic that this works, then the feather would be the next step. More questions? Thanks, Oliver. And so, uh, ideally, how would you like these 40 pieces to be used? And B, uh, how, you know, beyond these 40 pieces, Make the best of your work, like what, what, what you have in this. Uh, yeah, that depends on the community what happens with the. Oh, I'm talking about ideally from your point of view. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if this works as a whole. So, ideally, a lot of people get these boards and can do testing with this. And if it finds uh, a lot of bugs, then this is a good indication that it works. If not, then maybe we have to adapt and uh, improve. 
uh, I'm optimistic that the trade-off of not having a signal level verification but having it much easier and cheaper is actually good enough to get 90% of the bugs. But this is uh, not backed by any numbers, just a gut feeling, and we will get the numbers over time. <laughs> if my gut feeling was wrong, then it would make sense uh, to see if we can get Philip on the hill in something uh, of that format and see if we can get it cheap enough to, let's say, $6 or so, and distribute that instead, because that will also find the remaining bugs. Professor? So really full of stuff, uh, definitely lots of lessons learned, I guess, uh, from, from the Philip work. Um, way back when they did the, the, this embed board that was similar, and you mentioned some um, I squared C not being able to be that well tested or some limitations there. And what they did was just add a sensor, a generic sensor on there, and then you get all of the nice benefits of having some slave or we call it nowadays a uh, device um, uh, available <laughs> is the GPI just because it is nice to have that kind of control and flexibility, or was that the cheapest uh, I squared C slave implementation? A bit of both, actually, uh, because we can control the things, uh, we can also use uh, simple R. Uh, two RR resistor ladder DAC, which we can use to test the ADC, which should also reckon there's no PDM. So I also use this as a DAC. Uh, in this way, uh, I can yeah also test the ADC as well. Hmm. Okay, sorry, can I say ADC? I'm an expert C. Wait, no. um, okay, you can say uh, I see. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. And the uh, GPIO uh, standard is perhaps the cheapest um, I see device. Okay. And I can abuse it as ah, it's ah, yes, right. Okay, now I got it. Um, one brief question on the on the topic of payouts. Um, this application will need to work with a lot of um, with a lot of different boards um, and needs will need to map their pins out. And is there is there any layer through which we now expose that this this, this particular pin uh, GPIO pin is the one that the Arduino form factor says is D zero D one? Is that now in there? Yeah, exactly. That is why we use this. So uh, the test application uses this uh, Arduino pin map feature, and every board that provides this uh, can use this. And I think we have a. There's one more question, I think. I just uh, small number of the nodes when you start working for panels, most of the panels have the same amount, but like for example, the particle boards, which aren't built anymore but still supported by right, they have completely different amount than non panels. So, <laughs> 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 but why? <laughs> So uh, the next speaker is an